the length of these two, and whose angle from horizontal is the sum of these two angles. So in this case, the product, I don't know what the unit, let's say the unit is this big. The product is a small arrow at an angle something like this. Anyway, we find we can add and multiply arrows. The mathematicians call them amplitudes, I mean, and mathematicians call them complex numbers, and that's the structure of the world. Electrons were discovered in about 19 or 1895 or so as particles, and they were studied and believed to be particles. They behave very much like particles. You could count them. You could put one of them on an oil drop and measure the electrical charge. Uh, electrons responded to the presence of other electrons. If you had a metal plate here and a metal plate here and had an excess of electrons here and a defect so that what's left over is protons here, then an electron sailing through between the plates would be repelled from the other electrons and attracted to the proton and move in a curve something like this. Millions of electrons moving through a wire represent an electric current and so on and so on and the entire picture of electrons as particles going around in, uh, in matter was uh, or in explained many phenomena, and everything was going along all right. There were some puzzles about how they behaved in an atom. If you've heard about the atom as being a little solar system, the nucleus in the center like the sun, and the planets going around like electrons, then you're back in 1900 and something, 1910 or so, because it's quantum mechanical, as it turned out. By 1923, de Bruyne, the suggested that this business about mixture, this wave and particle properties like light, was probably also true of electrons. And though historically, the wave part, aside from Newton's error, the wave aspect of light was most obvious, and the particle aspect was discovered afterward. In the case of electrons, the particle aspect was most obvious, and the wave aspect was discovered afterward. By in 1924, only a short time after de Broglie's suggestion, Davison and Guillermo were doing some experiments bouncing electrons off of nickel, expecting them to bounce back this way, which they did. But they also discovered that some of the electrons went off on a crazy angle. And when they read de Broglie's paper, I can't pronounce it, sometimes they call it de Broglie, sometimes de Broglie, and sometimes de Broglie. It's a French name, so it's hopeless. And uh, they found that these electrons came off at a, an angle, and that they calculated the angle, what the wavelength had to be, because you know the spacing of that from the experiments with X-rays. They found out that that was exactly right, according to the Broglie's theory, and that electrons, in fact, did the same thing as light in the same kind of dual hocus-pocus. In translating the word dual hocus-pocus into better English or better physics is this. And even in the experiment involving electrons, going from one source, say a tungsten filament, to a counter of some kind, is exactly analogous to the situation with light. In fact, all of physics, as it turns out, as far as we can tell, is all the same framework. There's a probability for an event, and the probability is the square of an amplitude. And there's an amplitude that an electron goes from place to place. The amplitude can be compounded by addition when there's more than one way to happen and by multiplication when you can think of things happening in succession. That means that all the possible events in the world might be analyzable into separate simple events of which everything is a compound. For instance, uh, is it possible to describe like everything that happens as a series of events, for instance, it jumps it goes from here to here, it bounces off, it goes from here to here, and so on. Uh, I'll give a specific instance in a minute. What does turn out to be true, and this is what I, the content of the present lecture, is I want to start all over again and tell you, now that I've introduced and I've convinced you about the framework of probability amplitudes, I must give you the laws for the probability amplitudes, and that way give you the complete theory of quantum electrodynamics. Uh, it turns out there are only three laws, but to, they have to do with the idea an amplitude that an elect proton goes from place to place, an amplitude that an electron goes from place to place, and an amplitude that an electron emits a photon. 
I'll uh, describe them in detail now. Now I want, like, to give a more complete description of the way the laws of physics look, at least in this partial realm involving only electrons and photons. In order to give this description, I have to include something which I didn't include before. For simplicity, I include now the time. In the experiment which, oh, here it is. In the experiment which I thought I had just erased, but didn't, we can ask another question. We can ask if the source is made to emit a photon at a given moment, what is the probability that the counter receives a count or goes off at a given moment? This adds the idea of time to the things that we've been doing before. We can ask a question that's, in other words, more complete, not only where the thing is and at what time it arrives. And so we have uh, the following world. We have an amplitude inside of space time, space and time. Things move around in space, and they take time to do so. They don't really move. They have amplitudes for doing their thing, okay? But their thing is done in space and time. You can ask for the amplitude that a photon arrives here at a certain time and an electron is somewhere else at another time and so forth. Now, in order to describe both the space and the time pictures, I'm going to make a kind of graph which we call, which is very handy. If I call it by its name, you'll be frightened. So I'm not going to call it by its name. I plot the position in space si sideways here and the time this way. And I'm going to explain what such a diagram is by taking the old-fashioned world first, not the quantum world, and see what happens. So we take a baseball, it's standing still here. What does it look like on this picture? The space is supposed to be represented this way. Of course, we know space has more dimensions, but I don't have to draw them. I draw one out this way for the other dimension space, and the third one at right angles to both of these on this for the third direction of the space. <laughs> now, if I rep represent the baseball by a little slot here, at a given moment, there's the baseball. Later on, the baseball is in the same place. So later on means go along this way. Then later on, the baseball out here. That's the width of the baseball, okay? And later on, the baseball here and so forth. Why did I bother to make it a wide baseball? I don't know. <laughs> and so here, I could have made it a point baseball and made it easier to draw. The baseball, as a function of time on this diagram, would be represented by that band, all right? Now, if a baseball is moving, okay, it's drifting across the room, what does it look like? This time, I'm going to make a very much smaller baseball, okay? <laughs> or you're so far away, you can't see the sizes. Let's say it's here now. Later on, it's in another place here. And later on, it's another place here, another place here. So in this world, it'll go so. If it's coasting at a uniform speed, it'll be a straight line. If the baseball goes for a while, hits something, and comes back, then it'll go some, like this. There was something standing here, right? And it bounces back. Let's say this was a brick, which was standing still. And that would be a picture of a ball hitting a wall. It, all is, it goes boink, boink. And I stretch that out this way. Another way to, uh, well, that's, uh, I think, a pretty clear picture. And this, we represent situations in space time. So if I would do in space and time, which I inadvertently call space time, which is what everybody calls it. Now, uh, we could say, for instance, that at this particular place, we had a source which emitted a photon at a certain time. This is the time, and this is the place. Then later we can ask if at this place, a detector at that time would discover a photon. Now, if photons were baseballs, uh, we could say, well, maybe the photon went and played along here, or what have you. But we don't uh, have to say we don't know anything about how it goes, but you know what the answer is going to be. There's going to be an amplitude, huh? that a photon let out of here arrives here. And that amplitude will depend upon the time of this one and the position, and the time of this one and the position. And I'll call this point for just a moment number one point, and this a number two point. And then we have a thing which is called the amplitude for a photon to go from, from two, two, from one. 
And that's one of the great fundamental laws of nature, what that formula is for that. It's a little mathematical formula, and it's very simple. I do not want to bother you with exact mathematical expressions because it won't mean anything. It's uh, easy to describe for those who are more sophisticated. Of course, you realize immediately that this formula for this is going to depend only on the difference of the time and on how far you had to move the distance of the distances. So it's not so complicated. If the difference of the time is t and the difference of the distances is x, then the answer for, the, for this thing is this fun function, but I don't want to bother you with the mathematics. Only know that I can write it down in one second, and people who know this magic, this mysterious language, know what that means. So that this formula is extremely simple. It's as elementary as it can be. Well, it really is as elementary as it can be, as it turns out. Uh, in, uh, if we added a couple of principles, then uh, you can deduce what it has to be, knowing nothing except those principles. The principles are as follows. There's a knowledge of the relation of space and time. The way things depend on time and the way things depend on space are interconnected by a law, uh, which is the principle of relativity. And that tells us a great deal, uh, uh, limits the functions a great deal. The second proposition is that the probability that you get from this must have the prob property that if you add up the probability of every possible event, you get 100%. And if you make a wrong formula here, it doesn't check. You know, the probability of everything all added together has to be every possibility, which is 100%. Something's got to happen, in other words. And if you, if you get the wrong formula, it doesn't come out right. You find out that the probability of something happens is one and a half, or minus two, or something. So <laughs> adding relativity and that principle determines this almost completely. Not quite completely. I'll tell you a little more about it in a minute. This function that depends on these two things, just for the sake of this discussion, I'll call it D, say. Why D? T for photons. T is for photons. Between two and one. It's an amplitude of a certain size that depends on the distance between the two. You might at first be surprised because when we were dealing with photons over there, we said that the amplitude was rotating and depended on the time by going around the proportional to the time, depending on the color of the photon. Nothing has been said about the color of the photon over there. Something's wrong. No, it turns out as follows. I will explain it better later. The color of a photon is a result of the source. The source emitting uh, uh, has an amplitude to emit the photon, which is a function of time which is going around. Uh, when an amplitude for an event changes with time by simply rotating, not changing its place, but by changing its angle, it corresponds in the in real world, I mean the world we used to, the ordinary world, to a situation in which the energy of the system is definite. And what we've been talking about before were situations in which the color of the photon, the energy of the photon, was definite. And in those situations, the amplitude is turning around in time. This is, in fact, a result of the source. When we go back to discuss things as a function of time, and all photons are exactly the same, there's only one kind. If the amplitude varies slowly, it appears to his eyes a red photon. If the amplitude varies very rapidly, it's an X-ray. It's all the same. It's just one thing. There's only one kind of a photon when you cut the time. So you see, when you deal, discuss it in time also, so you see that uh, things are getting simple. 